our next speaker is uh, a Scottish author, a musician, and a social commentator. Many of you in the auditorium will know who he is and aware of his work. If not, uh, I'll let you know now that his book, Poverty Safari, which I've got to tell you is well worth the read, won the Orwell Prize in 2018. And as a social commentator, uh, he's invited uh, onto national TV press and radio on uh, many, many, many occasions. We are delighted to welcome to the stage Darren McGarvey. Hello. Just like to issue a trigger warning for any working class people who are here today. <laughs> They're selling juice with bits at the bar. <laughs> uh, I just want to begin by acknowledging for anyone at least who's been following my own work in the last year that uh, it's been a crazy year on a personal and a professional level. Probably the craziest that I've actually experienced because despite the dysfunction to which I became thoroughly adjusted as a child and a teenager, when actually against all your own internal beliefs you become successful or you do well, then there's not a great many reasons to continue being anxious, then it's incredibly disorientating. Anyone who has children will know, especially when they're young, that they develop at such a rate that even if you're gone for two days, it can often feel like you're coming back to different little people and different little rhythms that the household adopts in your absence in order to deal with the fact that you aren't there. Where things go, what time people go to sleep, what words certain people do and do not understand selectively, <laughs> if we're talking about a toddler. And one of the unfortunate aspects of everything that's gone on in the last year for me since the publication of Poverty Safari, a book in which I attempted ultimately to humanise a lot of the research with which you'll be familiar in your respective fields. Then I'm away from home a lot. And when I come home at first, I find it very difficult to get back into the groove Sometimes this fear that I don't know what I'm doing can manifest or find expression as a lazy or distant attitude towards my responsibilities in the household, particularly when it comes to my children. Yesterday, after having been away for a few days, I took my son, who is three, his name's Daniel, and my daughter Lily, who is one, out for a walk, given that it was very sunny and it wasn't threatening rain so we walked for two hours which actually is a very short distance if you are walking <laughs> with a three-year-old who wants to pick up every acorn and every plant smell the flowers daddy and uh, we had a lovely time and I felt like well I'm really getting out of the groove a lot quicker than I usually would been away for that a length of time and then just towards the end of the day when we're getting ready to go home my son who is potty training starts to look like he really needs the toilet but also a refusal to admit that he needs the toilet <laughs> or indeed to use the toilet when he's taken to the toilet on three separate occasions Now, at the precise moment when we were just too far from a toilet <laughs> and just too far from a taxi, my son's bills and bladder evacuated themselves. <laughs> and I went from feeling like I was handling everything relatively well 
to the most paralysing, painful feelings of frustration, of inadequacy, of panic, of desperation, standing in a public place with a screaming one-year-old in one arm, and a little boy who's in physical pain, who's also sensing that I'm upset, and I emotionally withdrew from him. I didn't realise that I had done it at the time. At the time, this presented in my mind as, well, I have to be tough on him if he's not responding to all of the advice on mum's net. <laughs> then I'm going to have to put the foot down. And it was only when I got home last night that the image of him hunched over the pram, trying to cuddle into my leg, it started to replay in my mind and I started to punish myself. And someone backstage just said to me, very wise that they are, that parenting is guilt and when you get used to that and just accept it, then you can move forward. <laughs> you feel guilty for leaving home to go to work and when you're at home, you feel guilty for not being at work. But ultimately, what that incident and the aftermath showed me is that I've got a head full of this stuff, this adverse childhood experiences stuff. I've got a head full of a visceral understanding that there are consequences to my emotional states, how that impacts on my behaviour and how that affects people around me, most notably my own children. I didn't study for years at university, I'm not an academic, indeed despite what some very generous and flattering people may say or think, I'm not an expert on anything, not even my own experience. That is the power of this movement, and a movement is absolutely what this is. Now I have some notes because despite the fact that I don't usually do the kind of Ted Talky style, I want to talk a little bit about a lot of the debate around adverse childhood experiences and in recognition of the magnitude of this particular moment I want to make sure that I am as precise as possible. The principle that how we think and behave impacts our children and that this impacts families and communities and wider society is no longer really up for dispute. You won't really find, even in more conservative moral worlds, a serious uh, argument against the fact that if your child is raised in a nurturing and supportive environment, then their outcomes will be better across the board when compared to someone who hasn't experienced that level of stability. The issue with the ACES movement for many people is that we speak in a ball on deck language and so often it gives the impression that what we're talking about is something new and that can be quite threatening for some people. What criticism of this movement, and I don't necessarily know if it should be called the ACES movement, I feel childhood adversity is sufficient in expressing what we're about rather than comparing one another's adversity and trauma. However, no good idea ever was implemented or accepted as a self-evident truth without a process of refinement through robust and honest and sometimes acrimonious criticism. Atheism, science, the developments in technology, health, innovations in democracy, the institutions that we see all around us are encoded with all the lessons that we've learned through our social evolution 
Often many of the things that we talk about, for example, the theory of projection, this idea of saying, oh, you're just projecting what's going on for you. And we just assume that that is something that we would all know, when actually it was probably a very hard-won insight that made a psychoanalyst very unpopular uh, in their time. It's often the case that change begins with a small number of people who can, for whatever reason, whether it be their experience or whether it be having applied themselves to education, can see beyond a horizon line of some sort. And so they have to engage in the very difficult and often thankless work of fanning out across society to persuade anyone that's willing to listen that their ideas may need to be reassessed. A couple of criticisms of ACEs in general I'll outline as tersely as possible. Just to give you an idea of where I believe we should all be at in terms of being able to kind of observe our beliefs and try and see things from the point of view of those who might criticise the way we think or discuss or implement some of what we know to be true. The first is the ACES scoring system. Now, obviously, most people understand that this is more of an illustrative tool than a diagnostic tool. We're not seriously saying that if you have a certain number of ACEs, you are clinically anything. It's really something for individuals who've experienced trauma to begin that process of conscientization, whereby they can quantify in a very vague but useful way their experiences and the impact that that has brought to bear on their emotional life, on their relational life, and on their health. Personally, for me, the AC score system made a lot of sense. But having read some of the criticisms, which I consider to be quite fair, then I can understand why, just because it works for me, doesn't necessarily mean that it should be universalised in some way. The other aspect that I believe we should be prepared to rethink is the idea of resilience. Currently, the emphasis is always on instilling people who have suffered trauma with resilience. The implication being that the people who haven't suffered trauma are resilient. Of course, the inverse is true. How can you be resilient if your resilience has never been tested? Often, the young people that we're working with are very, very resilient. When you consider everything that they've survived, the hostility that they've learned to intuitively navigate, to the extent where they can often, through a process of very careful manipulation, have an entourage of support workers running around doing everything for them. Admitting that the AC scores or the emphasis on resilience might need to be refined or recalibrated in some way is not admitting that the whole movement falls apart. It's not admitting that we're wrong, that we have bad intentions. It's simply engaging on that journey that all ideas and belief and value systems must go through in order to become the best possible version of themselves. However many critics level charges at the ACES movement that could apply to any human enterprise, the fear of careerism, professional prestige, the misapplication of resources to advance organisational objectives, or the appropriation of people's experiences in pursuit of a political agenda, I don't think you're going to find an organisation or an office, or a group, where these things don't find some sort of expression. Because where humans are involved in anything, there is always an ele element of uh, self-interest. 
The diffusion of knowledge from traditionally professional spheres, and I'm sorry if you all came to hear me talking about my dead mum. The diffusion of knowledge from professional spheres to grassroots individuals and groups is inherently threatening because what is being devolved to communities is not only knowledge but the power that comes with that knowledge. And this is where we need to begin thinking more politically. Not necessarily just within our organisation. But think about it like we were a political party. How would we be framing these arguments strategically in order to appeal to the broadest possible demographic in order to give our movement the necessary muscularity to enter public policy? We need only look to the Scottish Violence Reduction Unit for what I believe is a masterclass in smuggling radical ideas <laughs> into the mainstream in a politically intelligent manner. The Violence Reduction Unit, while always emphasising the need for compassion and smart justice, also recognises that there is a need for consequences for criminal behaviour, antisocial behaviour, and so doesn't rely exclusively, as so often many other social movements do, on moral calls to action. Because a lot of the research shows that we all come from different moral worlds. Our sense of what a moral priority is isn't universal. Some believe that liberty and freedom and privilege flows not from the fact that it's inherent to the human character, but because law and order and the adherence to it that gives a society shape is where these things ultimately emerge. Others believe freedom and compassion are the most important things. What we should be trying to bear in mind when we're bringing this discussion into different spheres is an awareness that just because someone doesn't always agree with our sense of priority, it doesn't mean that they think we're wrong about everything, and it doesn't mean they don't care about the welfare of children. And this is very, very important to bear in mind. Last couple of things. In recognition that there is going to be a political dimension to this at some point, then that is going to require not only being able to oscillate between what I believe characterises the ACES movement, which is a very kind generosity of spirit, compassion, good humour, but also, and I say this as someone who has experienced trauma, sometimes rather than flight, we're going to have to fight. And the fight is coming, and it's going to be on all sides. And people are going to say things that we don't like, including people who have experienced trauma, whose voices are very powerful in this discussion. In light of that, it's not just public opinion that we should be looking to change, or political opinion. Because there are, in fact, many other campaigns out there in specific areas and fields across society that are really dealing, essentially, with the exact same problem that we are trying to tackle, which is the impact of social inequality in Scotland. There is no reason why next year or the year after we can't have another conference where we invite tenants unions, where we invite people engaged in the process of trying to enhance workers' rights in, a, in an age of labour market flexibility. There is no reason why we can't create the conditions for charities who are often muted, understandably, in their criticisms of government to feel confident to go further than just outlining the data about inequality, but actually beginning to attribute some of what we see in this society to political decision-making itself. Because, believe me, 
If you get enough people on board in a society for a particular approach or way of thinking or change, political class will always give way. Always. And so as we move forward, then these, I believe, are the terms that some of us, not all of us, need to be considering. We need to be thinking about how does this stuff translate into public policy so that what ideas are normally considered radical become in themselves one day for people in the future, maybe even my child, self-evident truths that we look back and wonder, why weren't we doing that the whole time? <laughs> I hope you enjoy your day. I'm very much looking forward to hearing everyone else's contribution. And uh, I thank you for the bottom of my heart, not only the people who have organised it, but everyone who's come out today. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Darren McGarvey.